Thank you for joining me for the Michael Tobin Show. This is a massive end time prophecy update with author and Bible prophecy teacher Craig C. White. You've heard him on my show a few times. And it's going to be a total massive update of what is going on between Syria, Israel, Turkey, and things that you may not even have heard of. Let's pray for the peace of Jerusalem. There will be no need for... Now, this is my addition to how I see things as going on. A lot of us are looking for this the seven-year treaty, which will be the key to... Or, or, or that, will, that will be the cue for the seven-year tribulation. Um, but while we're at it, let's pray for the peace of Jerusalem because there will be no need for... Turkish President Erdogan's seven-year treaty to protect Jerusalem, as he said that he wants to do. He wants to be the protector of of Jerusalem, and also pray f- for Damascus and Israel that they can be defended against Turkish invasion. So yesterday, a friend, uh, you can look her up, Sharon Bus, who some of you may know of, had sent me a private message. She had sent to others as well. A, two, a 2015 article she had been made aware of from a site called Jews News titled Turkish President Calls on Muslims to Invade Jerusalem. I want to introduce Craig C. White once again, probably for the fifth time. Craig, how are you doing? I'm not sure, yeah. Awesome. Um, so you heard what I, what I just read, and I would like to... Um, confirm to all of our listeners, um, those who are going to download these shows, if we could just put it all in one program so we don't have to be saying refer to this article from 2016 and refer to this article from 2015. I think we can we can do that. I, I've done that, but let's give a complete update. On well, for one, this news passed me right by um, about the attempted coup attempt, the, or the so-called coup attempt. And this April, there's going to be some kind of referendum. And then there's a whole another story how Erwin has been saying some pretty far-fetched, fantastic things about how he wants to be some kind of a sultan or an imam of the revised. Ottoman Empire and, and how his his people and his nation are accepting him or rejecting him. Uh, can you go ahead and and enlighten us on who actually is Turkey? Because it, it's fascinating and, and there is no way, in my opinion, that, that it could be refuted who Gog and Magog is. And you've already covered <coughs> covered all that. And how Russia actually does come in. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't think Russia is part of Magog, uh, Gog and Magog at all, but uh, that's in Ezekiel chapter 38 39. But I think Turkey is specifically spelled out the chief prince or primary governor of Turkey will lead two separate invasions into Israel, uh, according to Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. And Turkish President Erdogan has been on a quest to uh, gather complete power for himself in Turkey, and, and he's succeeding. On April 16th, um, next month, um, they're going to have a nationwide vote, a referendum. Uh, all the citizens, the voting age citizens in Turkey will vote yes or no to have the Turkish constitution revised. And that's a big deal. They're going to go from, basically the prime minister up until now was the chief ruler of Turkey. And for 12 years, Turkish President Erdogan was the prime minister. But now that he's president, he wants to switch the constitution over to a presidentially led constitution. They'll still have a parliament, but Erdogan will have powers to select parliament members. And I believe there's 550 parliament members in Turkey now, he's going to be able to add 50 of his own hand-picked people to that number. So he already has a majority in his uh, AKP party in the parliament, and if he adds 50 more, he'll be able to 
make him the sole ruler over Turkey. Uh, Erdogan has announced to the world openly for probably the last uh, four or five years that uh, he wants to create a new Islamic Union, a Turkey, basically a revised Turkish leg uh, empire or a revived Ottoman Empire, you could say. So Turkey is going to be fundamentally changed into a one-man rule. Some people have called it a, a sultanate. Erdogan is going to be the undisputed uh, authority in Turkey if the referendum passes, and uh, I'm guessing it will. Okay, so when I look at the likeliness or the unlikeliness of something as on grand of a scale as this happening, I would say that it is very likely because um, you reminded your listeners uh, recently how the Turkish government is giving so-called refugees identification and citizenship so they could then turn and become refugees and voters in European countries. Uh, yeah, that's right. German <laughs> Chancellor, uh, what is her name? Angela Merkel. Yes. She's kind of spearheading, they call it a, a refugee movement, and it has Syrian refugees, the news is doing this to us here in the United States. We are led to assume that the Syrian refugees are actually Syrian citizens, but you and I know better. The majority of, quote, Syrian refugees going into Turkey, I think I can accurately say that the majority of them are not even Syrian in nationality to begin with, because as as biblical prophecy notes, those who are going to be invading in Syria are from along northern Africa and other uh, Middle Eastern countries. So these people that are so-called Syrian fighters, they're not Syrian fighters, they are foreign fighters, right? Yes. And, and I guess those would be the ones that are going to be going into Turkey mostly. Yeah, I don't even think that these uh, alleged refugees are primarily, uh, you know, Syrian people have been displaced. They're they're fighting aged uh, jihadists being sent over, and that's that's been verified. I mean, eighty or ninety percent of the people coming over are young men. So these are not people who are down and out. These are invaders, foreign invaders uh, against yeah, against the invaders. government of Syria. And, 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 you know, I often wonder, well, how is it that a certain prophecy will come to pass? And that's exactly what we're doing right now. We're, we're putting a lot of logic behind how, how um, biblical prophecy actually can come to pass. And what a brilliant idea, you know, when, when Satan is involved, because, of course, there's a reason why Antichrist is, is titled the Antichrist. Satan literally is involved. I believe goes back to when, when was the Muslim Brotherhood formed back in the 1800s and and then out of the Muslim Brotherhood of course came Al Qaeda and uh, and and other groups and now um, ISIS how would you say that ISIS would would be uh, referenced by by biblical prophecy or not 
exactly referenced. Well, it almost is exactly referenced. In the book of Nahum, it talks, uh, Nahum predicted the destruction of the ancient Assyrian uh, capital city of Nineveh. Today, Nineveh is Mosul in northern Iraq. You've probably heard about that in the news a lot. That's where ISIS took over the, uh, Iraq's second largest city, which is Mosul, in northern Iraq. And uh, that was in 2014. And since October, the middle of October, the Syrian army has made a concerted effort to get to you know get them out of there. And uh, Mosul has uh, two sides, the east and the west side, split right down the center by the um, Tigris River. So it took uh, the Iraqi army uh, three or four months to get rid of all the ISIS uh, fighters in the eastern half of Mosul up to the Tigris River. And now, since I think January uh, 19th, I think it was, they started uh, getting them out of the western uh, half. And what they've done is surrounded them, and the Iraqi army has surrounded ISIS in Mosul and has been pushing them and pushing them further into the center of Mosul. And right now, uh, ISIS is making a, a strong um, defense in the neighborhood called, uh, uh, I think it's called Old Town uh, Mosul, or uh, Old City, I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, they're in the oldest part of Mosul, very small, narrow streets. Uh, a lot of people are still uh, in Mosul. Mosul had a couple of million people originally. There's still about uh, 500,000 civilians who are trapped with ISIS in this in the very center of the old city. So uh, ISIS is making a stand in the old city of Mosul. Primarily their headquarters now is in the uh, al Nuri Mosque, which is an old mosque built around 1100 uh, AD, and uh, it's famous for a leaning minaret. You, you may, might uh, look that up and, and get a picture. It's an old, old building, kind of an interesting building. So the book of Nahum, the book of Nahum gives us the prophecy and the picture of exactly what is going on right now. And ISIS are the ones who are fulfilling what Nahum actually prophesied. Correct? Yeah, Nahum said that Mosul or that Nineveh would be uh, destroyed by a flood and by invading armies. Yes, and, and that is where Mosul is. Mosul is actually where ancient Nineveh was. Was yep. The, the ruins of Nineveh are still uh, still lying empty in the middle of the city limits of Mosul. So it's it's right there, and the, the locals still call Mosul Nineveh. Okay, they just unearthed a a uh, ancient palace in Mosul, correct? It, or where right. Nineveh was, and the last time that that palace was actually visible was like six thousand years ago. How many? 2,600, yeah. Okay. In 612 B.C., Nineveh was flooded and ransacked by the Babylonians, Medes, and Persians. The prophecy of Nahum parallels the events of 612 B.C. and the, and the fall of Nineveh and also the events of today. The same armies are gathered against Mosul as were gathered against Nineveh. Nahum talks about a palace being dissolved. The palace was just discovered in the old part of Nineveh, uh, in the city, old city walls of Nineveh. It's kind of interesting to see how that uh, palace was discovered. Back in 2014, when ISIS first came into Mosul, they destroyed a lot of uh, antiquity and artifacts, and they blew up a shrine that was dedicated to the prophet Jonah. Jonah is an important prophet for Israel and for Christians in the Bible, and it's also an important prophet for the Muslims, because Jonah is mentioned in the Quran, uh, God sent Jonah to Nineveh to tell him to repent or the city would be destroyed. <laughs> yeah, I, I just blew up the shrine in 2014, and then the Iraqi army went in just a few months ago and got ISIS out of the eastern part of uh, Mosul and found the palace of uh, uh, the Syrian king Sennacherib underneath the shrine of Jonah, which is now just ruined this level. But underneath there, they found an uh, opening and actually went into the temple for the first time since 612 B.C., the, the, the palace, I should say. The palace of King Sennacherib is right on the wall of ancient Nineveh, right next to the tri 
will send an overrunning flood to destroy the city, and that the palace will be dissolved. And back in 612, uh, Sennacherib's palace was inundated with water and covered over so that no one's been in it since then. It's just now been rediscovered. And in Nahum, the term palace actually means just a large meeting area, a, a building that can house high-capacity people for a meeting. And now the ISIS is making their last stand in the Almiri Mosque. So I think that uh, the Mosul Dam is going to break and it's going to flood Mosul just like a, just like the Tigris River flooded Nineveh in 612 B.C. And that Al-Nuri Mosque is our new palace that will be dissolved. These are just some of the similarities between Nahum's prophecy that described the events that happened in 612 B.C. and now. Nahum also says that the uh, the Assyrians back in 612 B.C. or ISIS today will be gathered closely together. Uh, Nahum actually says they're going to be bundled like uh, thorns or like briars that you would pull out of your orchard or garden to be burned. They'll be gathered together tightly and, and bound tightly to be destroyed. So the ISIS is pushed in a close uh, uh, situation in the Al-Nuri Mosque in, in the old city of Mosul. They're there now, and the people are flooding out of there at this point. There's there's still maybe 400 to 500 or 600,000 people still left inside of Mosul uh, under ISIS control uh, because that west side is a very highly populated area. And uh, But they're now they're running for their lives. There's, uh, fighting has been increasing. Uh, there's been U.S. airstrikes uh, in the old city, and they're complaining about a lot of civilian casualties. But now, the, you know, ISIS has been uh, shooting people that have been trying to leave, but now it's getting so bad that people, are, you know, by the hundreds and by the thousands are just running for their lives. So it could be that God is giving them an opportunity to escape and the motivation to escape before the flood hits. Uh, I think if Mosul floods and if their correlations of today are a valid prophecy of Nahum, then this is going to happen very soon, within you know next couple of weeks or days even. I, I think it's going to happen soon. So this is a very important thing to t- be talking about right now. Uh, the flooding of Mosul and Nineveh is a prophecy in the Bible, and we could be witnessing it very shortly. Okay, that is tremendously awesome, and, and you know, as I think about it, my my heart is just totally, totally warmed up because just a few months ago, when we were discussing these things, we we weren't we we were probably hoping that they could get rescued, but it didn't seem likely, you know, before the dam actually breaks. But now, uh, even mainstream news is reporting that a lot of them are being rescued. They're being they're being protected. The uh, ISIS is being held off, and all the different ways that people are actually being rescued and being able to escape there. It, it is just awesome, awesome news. Uh, this palace area, how did it actually get covered up? What was it, it was covered up with a. a because the dam wasn't there back in those days, so it had to have been a whole lot of water, whichever direction the river flowed. That's actually a, an amazing story. It was in 612 B.C. in the summer, I think May, June, July. Uh, actually, I think that Nineveh fell in August. For three months, in the middle of the summer, in northern Iraq, it rained and rained and rained and rained. A rock gets zero precipitation, typically, in the summer. None. And it rained and rained and rained and rained and rained. And the Tigris River swelled, overflowed its banks, and for, you know, 90 days or for however many days, it was breaking up against the, uh, the waves were breaking up against the walls of Nineveh until it finally eroded the foundation of the walls and about 900 foot section of the walls collapsed. And that uh, palace of Sennacherib is right on the wall of Nineveh. It would be one of the um, most directly places hit uh, by water that the Tigris River flooded, and it did. So, uh, it, you know, the foundations probably washed away, and it, and it was probably covered with mud and, and uh, so. Uh, so Moroccan soldiers actually went inside. They, they found tunnels underneath there that actually ISIS had dug. They thought they were looking for uh, Luke 
2015 for 2,600 years. Uh, after the flooding of Nineveh, the whole the whole town or the whole city, it's a pretty big uh, walled city. The whole city didn't get completely covered with water because uh, uh, the Babylonians and Medes and Persians were able to go in there and they ransacked it for two months and they took everything. They took everything. There was nothing left of the place. The flood that NATO predicts, it, it says it's going to be an overrunning, which means it's going to cover the city and he also says that Nineveh will look like a water reservoir for, for many days or many weeks. I don't think that that happened in 612 B.C. It certainly did get inundated with water, but uh, maybe it didn't go over the top of the city. So I think it's going to this time. Wow. What an amazing thing for something for thousands of years has, has been buried. And yeah. now we have proof that, uh, that yet another part of the Bible is correct, and it's not just myth. Oh, that's true. And of yeah. course, Jonah was no myth, as there is proof there. Now, unfortunately, almost nobody's talking about this, you know, including in the church. But I, I hope some people, uh, you know, will listen to your broadcast and understand that uh, the flooding of Mosul is very much in the Bible, and uh, all the events that seem to lead up to it have already uh, taken place. It's ripe to be flooded. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Let's inform people of the grammatic errancy in what is a, is probably a hundred year old doctrine or so about Gog and Magog being Russia. What is it that we know now about the literal translation of Gog and Magog and, and where those words the region actually originates from? Well, we don't really know anything new. It's always been in the in the scripture. It's not that difficult to understand. Well, it's, it's, al it's uh, almost as if it was purposefully misinterpreted. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, the West and Christianity in the West, you know, they're so used to seeing Russia as bad guy. <laughs> uh-huh. So it's easy for people to see Russia in Scripture. They, 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 they interpret many things as being Russia, and it's, it's just not right. I mean, Russia might be in there a little bit, but not, not as much as people think. So that could have been propaganda and, instituted by uh, prominent members of the church then? Yeah, you know, I don't know if it was a conspiracy or not, but it's been a popular view that in Ezekiel uh, chapter 38 is talking about a Russian land invasion into uh, Israel. And I don't think that's right at all. It's a Turkish-led invasion. People say it's Russia because of the word Rosh, which is a Hebrew word that means first or primary. In Ezekiel chapter 38, uh, verses 1 through 3, it talks about the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. That's the primary governor of Meshach and Tubal. Meshach and Tubal were uh, people. They were brothers of Magog. All three brothers, they were original princes set over provinces in Turkey. So Magog is the chief prince or primary governor amongst the provinces of Turkey. That's who Magog is. People like to say that the Hebrew word Rosh, well that sounds like Russia. Yeah, but the, it sounds like it, but it's just talking about the primary governor. So, you know, people get off on tangents and they can prove their point, you know, in 10 different ways, but uh, I think it's completely wrong. And, uh, in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 5, it says that Iran, Libya, and Sudan will join Turkey in invading Israel. And Iran, Libya, and Sudan have been fighting in Syria for the last five years. And the last year, year and a half, they've all been in the Golan Heights of Syria lobbing you know, shells into Israel, into the Golan Heights of Israel. So those three armies are there ready to invade Israel, just like Ezekiel chapter 38 says. And uh, Turkey has already entered Syria in the northwest. It's Jeremiah chapter 49, verses 23 to 27. It says that the northwestern city of Hema and Arpad, today Arpad is called Tel Rafat, will hear evil reports of a coming invasion, and, after the, and they'll be terrified. And then after that, the citizens of Damascus will flee, and then Damascus will be destroyed. And when it says Damascus, it specifically identifies the old city of Damascus, which is the, the center of Damascus, the oldest part. It 
all of Syria is, or what Syria is in the uh, old part of Damascus, that's what's going to become the one that's heat. Because as you know, much of, of Syria and part, or, you know neighborhoods around Damascus have already been reduced to rubble. But it's that old part of Syria, and it's going to be Turkey that does it. It's going to be Turkey that, that leads it. And it makes sense that it is Turkey because Turkey has already funded or actually come down into the borders of Syria on a, on occasions, but they actually want a a permanent presence inside Syria's border. They they don't have their permanent position inside Syria's border yet, do they? Yeah, they kind of do. Um, they've taken over a pretty good piece of land just north and a little bit east of Aleppo, all the way to the Euphrates River, uh, right on the Turkish border. They, they, they have control of that area. Uh, I don't know how many Turkish troops are there, but there are a few thousand, and they're joined by Al-Qaeda rebels. They're more, so, than, they're more than just advisors, right? Because that's how the oh, United yeah, States yeah. gets have, their foot in. Tanks. We're advisors. Yeah, they have tanks and missiles and everything okay. and stuff, and, and they're leading the... Uh, the foot soldiers, which are the Al-Qaeda rebels. Okay, and I always so, point this out, that, that they have uh, American Patriot missiles along their, inside the Turkish border, overlooking the Syrian border also. Yeah, I know they did. Uh, uh, there was some talk about uh, taking those down. I don't know if they did or not. I think the talk was that they wanted to uh, upgrade them. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. it could be. Yep. It is, it is all coming together. You know, all, every, everything that we read about about these end times, and, and, and we see how it, how it can happen, and, and it is the the big thing is that it there's no unlikelihood. It, it is all likely and and imminent all at once. When people say peace, peace, it's going to be sudden destruction. Uh, well, that verse where it talks about when they say peace, peace, and sudden destruction, that's specifically talking about the Jews in Jerusalem. I think that applies specifically to the tribulation period where they've made a pact with the Antichrist, which I think is Turkish President Erdogan, uh -huh. to, have a, to have a temple and uh, to have international security forces inside of Israel and to have two-state solution and that kind of thing. And they're going to say, finally, we have peace, we have a temple, everything's going to be fine, which they're already saying, uh, the proponents of building a new temple. They're going to say that they're saying that it's going to usher in an unprecedented period of uh, world peace and especially peace and security for Israel. And, but when they say that, then Turkey and Libya and Sudan, it says, will be with them, will invade um, Jerusalem, and they're going to be in for three and a half years of uh, serious trouble. Uh, I mean, I think nation will rise against nation for certain, but uh, specifically uh, Jerusalem and Israel are going to be in big trouble. Exactly. There wouldn't be a need for a treaty unless there was a lack of peace in a city. And, and in, as yeah. I, Isaiah chapter 40, it says, is it chapter 40? It says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I think it might be 40 or 41. Okay, sure. yeah, uh, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And, and up until this morning, I was just thinking, I, for years I was like, why is God telling us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem? So we know that Jerusalem will be overrun by the Antichrist in his arms, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. At some point. Now, Erdogan, you mentioned that 2015 uh, article, has already told the entire Muslim community, you know, internationally, that they need to invade Jerusalem and protect Jerusalem for Islam. Yeah. They, okay. they want to create a need Erdogan, for protection, just like the gangsters. Erdogan is the leader of let's invade Jerusalem. Let me just give you a quick scenario of how I think things are going to happen. And they're going to happen. When they start happening, I think they're going to happen rapidly. Okay, good, because this is a great part of the to be referenced by all of our listeners. This uh, uh, part I'll, right I'll here. I'll throw in some uh, current events along with some mostly Bible stuff. But uh, there's a referendum April 16th. One way or another, if that passes or not, everyone's going to get supreme authority in Turkey. After that, he'll be able to do anything he wants. And for the last five or six years, he's been wanting to invade Syria and remove Assad from power. He wants to put a Muslim Brotherhood leader in Syria. So after he gets supreme authority, he can just say, okay, we're going, we're going full force into Syria. 
you know, the Bible talks about Hema and Tel Afar. You might be hearing about those in the news. That those are places where Turkey hasn't reached yet. They'll invade those two cities, and then they'll go down to Damascus, which is not very really far from Hema, and besiege Damascus, destroy Damascus. The residents before that will flee into uh, Kir or Kirak in Jordan. Which is a, there's a big uh, Syrian refugee camp there right now. So Damascus will be destroyed. Sudan, Libya, and Iran, which are already in the Golan Heights of Syria, Turkey will come. The Turkish army will come down from Damascus, which is right next to the Golan Heights. Okay, and what what was Sudan called in the Bible? Oh, that was an interesting question. Uh, everywhere you see Ethiopia in the English Bible, it's really talking about Sudan. Okay, good. I wanted that the, to come. The word out. is Cush. It's Cush was a grandson of Noah. Okay. That uh, was the name, C-U-S-H. That's actually just a land south of Egypt, which is Sudan. Yes, and that was a British thing uh, on naming places, but uh, where Ethiopia is mentioned in the Bible, biblical Ethiopia is now called uh, Sudan. Yeah, okay. uh, Ethiopia is a relatively new name. The King James, you know, our translators used it, but I don't think it came about until like maybe 1200 AD, something like that. Okay. So it's relatively new. Okay. But, uh, so continue. Anyway, uh, so the, Turkey will lead those uh, three nations into um, the Golan Heights of Israel, and maybe they'll go you know, a little further. They've already stated uh, Iran and Libya is t- together. They say that that's Al Qaeda and Hezbollah, which are typically don't get along. But they've already said we're going to have a joint attack into into Israel, and we, and we want to go to the, the Sea of Galilee. And Hezbollah, Hezbollah is in Lebanon, just north of the Israeli border, which Hezbollah is mainly funded by the Syrian government, correctly? And Iran. No, no. Yeah, Lebanon is basically the headquarters of Hezbollah, but probably most of your Hezbollah members are in Iran, and everything's probably funded through Iran. Okay. Oh, Iran and, and Lebanon, that's the, those are the Hezbollah strongholds. They'll come down into the Golan Heights, and Ezekiel chapter 38 says that that's not going to go well at all. It's going to rain like crazy on them. They're going to be shooting each other. God's going to send them diseases. It's just going to be a mess, and uh, he's going to cause them to retreat. So that's not going to go well. They'll invade Israel, but they're going to fail and, and retreat. Then I think that, like you said, you know, we'll, you need a peace treaty because there, there's turmoil. That's turmoil, and I think that might prompt seven-year treaty. So I think we're very, very close. And uh, that, along with the flooding of Mosul, if that happens, you know, that's another amazing thing. And I actually think the flooding of Mosul is tied into all these end-time events, because I think that the flooding of Mosul is tied into the sign of Jonah. Jonah was sent to Nineveh, and uh, Jesus told the Pharisees in his day that uh, I'll give you one sign that I'm truly your Messiah, and that's the sign of Jonah. And he goes on to talk about the men of Nineveh rising up and condemning the generation of Israel. Oh, that's important because a lot of uh, yeah. uh, evangelists and you know, in, in Bible school and stuff, they preach about the end times where Jesus is telling the people that were asking for a sign, he says, I won't give you a sign except for the sign of Jonah. Th- that is right. good for all of us to to take into account that the sign that he's talking about is related to the flooding of Nineveh. Yeah, the specifically. Ultimate flooding that, of Nineveh, which is now Mosul. Yeah, that, yeah. Jesus said that, you know, this is, uh, Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, I'll be in the belly of the earth for three days, and he had been from the dead. That is certainly specifically the sign of Jonah. But I think associated with it is where Jonah was sent to, and that's, to Nineveh or Mosul. I, I think that's the one end time sign to Israel that Jesus is truly their Messiah and that their time of trouble is, is close. Yeah. Time to repent. And what an odd place for God to want people to be worshipers of him. It's not just Israel that God, you know, desired to be his worshipers. Um, 
it didn't happen in China. It didn't happen in where Europe is. It happened in in uh, Nineveh, where God saw all this wickedness and He did this incredible sign. So He wants us to. Re Jesus is. I guess He's telling us what you're saying is He's telling us to remember what Jonah's mission was. Yeah, and that's where the location the is that Nahum is talking about also. Uh, yeah, you're right. They never repented, and they, and they became believers in, in God, in the God of Israel. And so, and even today, you know, the, the residents of Mosul are fleeing Mosul by the hundreds and thousands at this point. They're just running for their lives. And that they could be saving themselves from that flood. So, I think God is showing them mercy again. And God wants everybody to know Him. He loves everybody. And Christians, Muslims, wherever you come from, people should pay attention to God because He loves us, He's merciful, but He does judge us. And He, he won't hold His judgment forever. You know, eventually, you, know, you pay the price. It's time for people to pay attention. The end times are upon us. And uh, I'm afraid that so many people are already behind the understanding what's going on. All right. Well, Craig, thanks again, once again, as always, for being on the show. And I hope it's a, a good update that people can actually uh, download and refer to. I'm, sh I'm sure it is. It, it's a good update for me. And uh, I, I thank you, and I also thank Sharon Buss for uh, bringing up the point. It, it's just amazing because I'm always praying for the nations. Um, so uh, I appreciate you being on the air. I'll go ahead and give your website. It's www.hightimetoawake.com. For all you listeners, go ahead and go to that website, and you can uh, check out more of what uh, Craig C. White has to say. Pretty much everything that that's uh, end time prophecy. It was very nice talking with you. All right, Craig. God bless you. Thank you again. Okay. God bless you. Thank okay. You. Bye. There you have it, folks. Man, what a show.